Welcome to Designing SimCity Build It. So, my name is Petri Ikonen. Um, I'm creative director at Track20, and Track20 is EA's mobile studio in Helsinki, Finland. Very briefly about my career, I joined the games industry uh, year 2003. I uh, joined Sumea, and then Sumea was acquired by Digital Chocolate, and I worked at Digital Chocolate about nine years. And those early years, we did uh, Java mobile games, then we did some PC downloadable casual games, we did touchscreen premium games, and then very big revolution, we pivoted uh, to Facebook gaming, and of course, what it meant, it was that, hey, free to play and also uh, games as service. And for sure, it was a big learning for all of us. Then 2012, I joined EEA and we established the mobile studio in Helsinki, Finland. Uh, today, we are about 50 people, uh, 18 nationalities. So it's a very multinational, multicultural, very senior team and, and, and really a great place to work. And we are fully focused on mobile and our first game um, is and, and was uh, SimCity Build It. Uh, SimCity Build It, it took about one and a half years to develop this game. Uh, soft launch happened 2014, October, and then we went global uh, December 2014. But the project was not very easy. I have to be very honest on that. So today I'm going to talk about design challenges that we faced with this project. And a little bit about the big, big picture. What does it mean to really take this kind of very big brand, big gaming IP, SimCity. It has 25 years of history and then change that to a totally new platform. Lots of things are changing. What is the big picture? Then I, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, importance of UI and UX, and then a couple of kind of key takeaways, importance of testing and knowing your uh, players and also about how important it is that you have a great uh, team culture. So that's the topic of the talk uh, today. So let's reimagine SimCity for free to play and mobile. That's easy, right? Well, it was actually a very difficult thing. And what's going on is that, hey, you are coming from very big screen to very small screen. Uh, totally different uh, controls from piece, a keyboard and mouse to touch, and also very different kind of uh, use case. P on PC, SimCity was played very long sessions, and now suddenly you have this small device and you are playing very short sessions multiple times a day. And also I think the big picture is also, if, if we think our audience, SimCity is very well-known IP, but still the core audience for those old PC versions, it was quite hardcore, quite niche. And of course, when we went to mobile, we wanted that, hey, we want a much broader audience. So it meant that, yes, we are also shifting from hardcore to more uh, casual, from very complex to uh, simpler. So, what kind of conflicts you face when you have such a uh, setup? And when we started the project, we were really excited that, hey, we are the ones that are creating the next SimCity, and it has to be this and that, and, and we were thinking that what is really the, uh, what is SimCity all about? And, and, and we were kind of, as a team, very kind of adamant that we want to be true to the IP. So we want to keep the simulation. Yes, we did that. Under the hood, there is a very complex simulation running all the time. Also, uh, we wanted to keep the game as sandboxy as possible so that you can be as 
good or bad mayor as you like. You can create very beautiful city or very dirty and ugly city, whatever you want as a mayor. So those were the design pillars that when we started. But the thing is that all those great ideas are actually conflicting very badly with all the basic free-to-play mobile design guidelines. So all that uh, really meant that we had a really difficult project. And I think the big kind of lessons were that, yes, you have to understand the IP, you have to understand the DNA, but the truth is that you have to redesign from scratch. Multiple times I was guilty. I said that, hey, on PC we have this, let's say, this residential industrial commercial simulation. Let's move that as is to the mobile game. We tried that, it failed. So many times I would claim that port or adaptation won't work. Understand the theme and understand the game, DNA, but then re uh, design for mobile, for free-to-play. And also I think it's really a um, big thing to understand that who is your audience. And that was something that we were early in the production struggling a lot, because as a team we were all the time kind of arguing that are our players those very hardcore PC type of SimCity players, or are they, they very casual, more like decorative uh, gameplay builder players? And it was kind of an ongoing battle inside the team that who are our audience? And of course, there are ways to solve that. Then about UI and UX. And I guess many of you know how big part those things are in mobile games. Many games are actually played on UI level. And also we face that, that we are looking at that, this uh, beautiful city and we thought that this game would be great without UIs. But the problem is that it's very difficult to communicate anything to, uh, to a player without UIs. So we need UIs. And then when we start to create and design UIs, we have a lot of problems. How can we fit all that information to small screen how actually we are building a city with touch controls. And actually, let's remember that we have to all the time support those very short, typical mobile um, play systems. This is one example, very early design mock-up. Uh, the question was that, okay, in SimCity, build it, it's a mobile game. How do you create roads? And the answer is, of course, everybody can answer it. That, yes, you use your finger and you draw it. Simple as that, kind of solved. But the actual thing was that we uh, implemented and designed this five or six times. Because it was really difficult to find the right way to do it so that it's easy, understandable, usable, and fun. So a couple of lessons what we learned uh, on UI and UX. The first claim is that design can't be greater than UI, meaning that UI has to communicate the design. So very typical case is that, okay, let's design very complex system and we all think that, oh, this is so nice uh, rule set. But then when we start to implement it, we realize that, hey, oh, UI can't anyhow, it can't just handle all that information. And it was a very typical problem that we were uh, facing almost every day. So we had to simplify. Also, we learned that making paper prototypes, which are pixel-precise Photoshop mockups, so that we can make sure that, yes, the design can work also on very low-end Android screens. Lowest possible, kind of the smallest possible screen size. Yes, we can fit all the information. Still, the UI is looking good. It's fun to use. Uh, so it helped a lot, a lot. Also, I think multiple times, my mistake, we tried to, again, steal conventions, UI conventions from PC. Always failed. And, and again, I'd say that let's remember it's a mobile game, it's played in short sessions. 
And then those were the kind of very typical design challenges that we were facing. And during that one and a half years of production, we, we pivoted design a couple of times. We more or less uh, implemented most features at least three, four times. And what saved us? What saved this project? And I would guess, uh, say that definitely it was user testing. Uh, what happened was that uh, after about six months of development, we were trying to reach alpha, and we were totally blind. You know that feeling. You have been working on a game, then suddenly you are not anymore sure that is this fun or not. Are players getting what we are doing? The team starts to argue that this is not fun, this is fun, is this for these kind of players? Is this for these kind of players? And it's kind of a never-ending fight that where are we? And we should reach alpha. Fortunately, that time we had guts to uh, take our first big uh, user testing round. It was eight-day longitudinal study. So there were about 100 players in the US. They played eight days the game. And we got videos from the very first hour and the last hour. And the game failed really badly. It was not fun. Players didn't understand that what is the goal of the game. Hey, well, come on, it's a city builder. But they didn't understand that. There was lots of usability uh, issues. And, and day eight videos told that I don't like this game. So it was, of course, a shock. We postponed Alpha um, about three, four months. Then we analyzed all those videos. We started to create user stories like, as a player, I want to understand what is the uh, goal of this, this game. As a player, I want this and that. And we prioritized those user stories. And then sprint after sprint, we addressed those issues. And we reached Alpha. And at the same time, we had exactly the similar uh, test. And now players were enjoying the game. And we were, of course, that, oh, this will be something, and, and we are on the uh, right track. Definitely, there were more problems. And we continued uh, working similar way, analyzed, started to address those issues. Uh, we went soft launch. We did even third round. And again, we were able to see that, hey, we are getting better scores. And what is great, eight day, last minute, the last step of the testing is that delete the app. And the users were saying that, I don't want to delete this app. I want to keep my city. And that time, we know that, yes, it, it will be something. And, and of course, it was really interesting to cross-check with the um, metrics from the soft launch. Still, there were issues. We addressed those, and then we went global, and, and immediately it was a success. So to be honest, without user testing, this game would be definitely failed. So it's, I think, very important story. Also, later, I think I also uh, understood, understood very well that how important it is to understand that who are your players, what do they value, what are their motivations. So if you understand all those uh, user segments that you have, so you then start to understand the motivations like that, okay, we have, let's say, creative storytellers, they value decoration, freedom, that kind of stuff. We may have, let's say, strategic leaders who want to really optimize their city. They want to perhaps uh, play together their friends. And, and so we have identified those biggest segments, and we understand those motivations. And now it makes so much easy to uh, brainstorm and design uh, features for those players, because we can, we can kind of double check that, yes, we are serving all those different kind of players. So that's also one hint when you are working on your game, that if you know your audience and you can find those segments and motivations, you can really think that, am I serving 
uh, that kind of players. But uh, for us, it was definitely more like a post-launch uh, thing. Then something that I've been thinking a lot is that although the project was so hard and we were arguing so much, what was interesting was that no one left the team. And I was thinking that, yes, it's, there is something in our culture that that is, is good because people are arguing it. We have very long days and, and hard feelings, but we still keep together and, and we are working together. So I think it's about openness and transparency and trust. One, one quite funny thing is that when we started the project, I was the only designer and it was really bad thing. Uh, first six months, me trying to serve the whole team, we had more or less design process was waterfall. I designed something, executive producer approves, we create assets, we implement UI, the system, we have the feature ready, and it fails. And then back to square one, we lose three, four weeks, and it fails again. We kind of understood that this won't work, and we started to include the whole team to the design process so that when we start a small team starts to work on some feature. We make sure that the whole that team is together, kick, kind of have a kick, very good kickoff meeting where we discuss the whole design through and have this kind of very open and honest culture that if it's a bad design, it's very easy to say that, hey, Petri, that sucks. That is a very bad thing. Let's make up something better. And it's, it has worked for very well for us that it's totally open, brutally honest. And on the other hand, when everybody is in the team feeling that, hey, we are contributing to the game and to the design, the motivation goes up and everybody is really feeling that, hey, this is our game and this is my game. So I think it's a great thing. Personally, I don't believe very much that kind of genius designer myth who can alone solve these kind of games. I believe that a great team working together creates great games. And definitely this never give up mentality, I, I believe it's something a little bit like Finnish. You know, very cold winter, there's no way that you give up. If you give up, you'll die. So let's wrap up. So what we did, we had this big IP, we had to reimagine on mobile, we had, a lot, we had lots of problems, especially with UI, UX. We had problems to simplify, we did a lot of mistakes trying to uh, port PC stuff to mobile. Don't do that, redesign from scratch. Uh, remember the user testing and, and team culture. And if you ask key takeaway, definitely I think it's this importance of testing and also then later importance understanding and knowing your audience. So this was my talk. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions about SimCity Build It uh, over there? Hi. Uh, first of all, I'm a big fan. I've been playing since day one. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask, since since the launch of SimCity, there are many layers and um, improvements that were done on the game, right? Mm -hmm. Like the Omega um, yep. events, and then now there's the, the Players Club. So how do you know when enough is enough and the city is so complex? Um, so the question is that we are adding more and more features, and when do we know that enough is enough? The answer is that there is no such a thing that enough. The game is never ready. We will be uh, adding more stuff and, and, and rebalancing and changing everything. Uh, so uh, kind of as, as long as uh, there are users and players who enjoy the game. And of course, we try to very honestly listen to our players and serve, serve them. It won't be ready. Uh, so quick question. You um, said that you had a lot of challenges trying to port a PC model economy and a PC type experience into the game during development. Did you look at any existing free-to-play games within the genre before and how did they influence your thought process? 
So the question was that even though we are coming from PC to mobile, did we look at the similar mobile uh, titles on the market, right? Of course we did. I mean that it's quite natural that you are playing a lot of free-to-play uh, mobile games and, and you are checking how, how they are doing. And, and of course I'm very interested on, on, on design and how they solve monetization and so on. Definitely we played all possible uh, city builders that, that, that there, there has been on the market. Thanks a lot for the talk. It's really Thank interesting. You. And um, you mentioned a very interesting topic surrounding um, like design and the rest of the team and how to involve the team in the mm-hmm. creative process. And um, on one hand, you have the top-down approach, which you mentioned, like can be challenging, but then you have, on the other extreme, like the chaos of everybody having yep. a voice and yep. struggling to find the balance. So based on your experience, like with this game, for instance, and uh, what type of processes did you come up with and best practices like to find the right balance? Yes, what kind of, how did we change our design process? Excellent question. So from that stupid waterfall, we went more like that, that, Kind of the design, uh, let's say that we have two week sprint. We are developing certain feature. So, kickoff meeting, we check the, that everybody agrees on design. We start creating first UI mock ups. Everybody is double checking that yes, UI can support the, um, design. If not, on the fly, we iterate design and we start implementing it. And whenever we have anything to play, we start testing and say that, hey, there are flaws. Let's change design, this and that. And it can be artist, it can be uh, programmer, product manager, whoever in the team saying that, hey, we could improve this and we iterate on design on fly. So during that two-week sprint, the design may change quite a bit. But the good news is that most probably we have something good at the end, not something that we, uh, which will fail. Thank you. Thank you. Do, you. do you feel that, I mean, this, I think there's uh, this kind of Finnish game design culture, which usually is kind of pretty inclusive. So do you kind of feel that you went from the EA way back to like the kind of Sumer digital chocolate way of making games? Or? Um, I think it has changed. During my career, it has changed a lot. And there has been some teams that are really want to work on design. Then at sometimes at Digital Chocolate, I had a team that who said that, we don't want to design, do the design, we'll draw and implement and everything. So on the other hand, I'd say that, hey, every project, every team deserves own process, own way to do. If it's kind of somehow true to to those people and you feel that this is how we like to work. I don't say that there is one way to work. Uh, I would also like to thank you for the presentation. Very, very uh, interesting. if you could uh, only uh, solve one problem for me, so I have a very specific question. Uh, you uh, talked in your presentation about uh, game design uh, choices and uh, iteration of different uh, choices be- uh, in in team uh, among team members. So uh, I'm gonna uh, lay out a situation in a simpler words, but I really want to know what would you uh, choose. So uh, our game was uh, not a mobile game; it was a a large PC game on Steam in early access and everything. But the problem was this. We had a UI decision to make. It's a very complex UI, but uh, programmers, uh, they had one idea. It was the best possible choice how to make that UI, how to make it functional, how to program it. The designers had a completely different idea, and they also had a very, very good uh, reasons why it should work like this. Uh, it was the best uh, design choice. And we made both things, actually, and tested it, and both actually worked pretty well. Then we released both things on early access in two different updates to see what's going to happen out there. And we had about 50, 60,000 players. And 90% of them uh, agreed on third idea that was developed on community forums. So in that case, which path would you follow? Uh, excellent question. It's so long to repeat that I won't do that, but many times when we have had that kind of discussions, then someone says, I think, very good words. Let's put players first. Let's think that what, as a player, I'd like to see or experiment or, or whatever. So that has always been kind of, when we start that kind of discussion, 
okay, let's put players first. As a player, what would be the best thing? Uh, I, I need to ask though, like, um, do you ever get into a situation where it's pretty obvious that what the players say they want and what the players actually want are totally opposite things? Mm, that's possible too. Yeah. But I think, for example, with especially with many times with monetization and free-to-play mechanic design questions, I think that's something that we have learned as a team that that let's not try to be too greedy or think that, hey, how can we squeeze the money? It's more like that, hey, let's think about that. what would be the best solution for the player because we think and I think that retention is, is kind of the key. That's the number one. If we have a fun game and the retention is there, then there is a possibility for great things also from in business side. Thank you so much, Petri. Great talk. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much.